Hello all, welcome to episode seven of Blue Connections 2020. My name is Donna Ozarko and I am the manager of officials and publications for Softball Canada. And I'm Jeff Whipple, the national director of umpires. We're so excited that you're able to join us again. Blue Connections 2020 is bringing umpires together virtually across the country and around the world to learn from some of our country's leading officials. These webinars will focus on the basic techniques and expectations for officials and will references best practices on game mechanics, management and fitness from both the WBSC and Softball Canada. And just a reminder that all sessions will be recorded and available on our Softball Canada Umpire YouTube channel and Facebook pages. If you have any questions for our presenters, you can leave them in the chat section and we will pass the questions on to the presenters in the end. Strike three, one of the unmistakable sounds of the game. It can also generate some of the strongest reactions from players. Join two of Canada's best international umpires as they take a look at how every umpire can develop and maintain a consistent strike zone at every level of competition. Terry Richter started playing softball when he was eight. He soon fell in love with the game and played every summer until 2005. Terry decided to try umpiring in 1994 to earn a few extra dollars and then soon realized that umpiring had a lot of other benefits to offer. He received his level five in Prince George, Alberta in 2005, and Terry has attended six Canadian provincial championships as a working official, four as a UIC or DUIC. He's also represented Canada internationally five times, with the last event being the 2019 Pan Am Games in Lima, Peru. Terry is currently the provincial umpire in chief of Alberta and has been since 2011. And Jason Clark has been an umpire since 2001. He achieved his level five in 2014 and became WBSC certified in 2018. Since then, he rep represented Canada at the Border Battle European Championships in Italy, and most recently in 2019 at the USA Softball Men's A Championship in Nashville. He is involved in the province of Alberta, where he is both umpired and has been a UIC at numerous provincials. <laughs> that wasn't my dog, by the way. <laughs> I think uh, I think Terry's uh, gone off to to deal with the dog, but that's okay. <laughs> Welcome uh, both of you, uh, Jason. Good to see you. Yes, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. And I see Terry's <laughs> making his way back. I'm going to turn the screen. I over apologize for that. Well, that's okay, <laughs> my friend. That's okay. We've all seen it before. <laughs> and I'm going to let my dog out now and let you guys yeah. get out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm going to. Where did my button go? <laughs> I want to make tonight. There we go. Terry Richter, make the presenter. There we go. So okay. good, good to see you guys. And thank you, Terry. Thank you, Jason, for taking the time to come and visit us tonight. Um, and uh, we're looking forward very much to seeing this. We've got a good crowd tonight. So. Okay. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right, so tonight we want to talk about, um, sorry, let me get this slideshow from the beginning. There we go. All right, so tonight we want to talk about uh, keys to a consistent strike zone. Um, how is it that you develop a strike zone, a consistent strike zone throughout uh, your career? Tonight we'll be talking about clinics, um, how you can practice uh, during the year, your pregame, uh, once you get your assignment, how do you approach the game and how do you get in the right mindset? During the game, how do you stay focused? How do you make sure that your strike zone stays consistent? And after the game, do you self-evaluate? And then we want to also talk about monocular vision. Uh, first of all, we want to talk about what is a consistent strike zone. What's a, what does a consistent strike zone look like? Acting or done the same way over time. Um, especially to make things fair and equitable. Uh, unchanging in nature, standard, or effect over time. All right. Sorry, I just got to move some stuff around on my screen here so I can see what I'm doing. All 
right. Well, we want to talk again. We'll, uh, I want to talk about clinics, practice, pre-game, during the game, after game, and monocular vision. So starting on the slow pitch side, um, as you can see by the diagram here, the umpire uh, is positioned in the slot with his ear on the edge of the plate or the mat. Um, the plate is 17 inches across, and then the mat is two feet wide, three feet long. So you've got a lot of room there um, to call your strikes. Um, you want to keep uh, both eyes uh, have an um, from this position, both eyes have an unobstructed view of the outside edge of the plate. That gives you a great uh, look to, to maybe to see those. If you're not using a mat, you can use that to uh, call the outside corner. Um, one of the things you want to do is be comfortable in your ready position. Kind of uh, knees bent, ready to go, ready to move if you have to. And your feet are going to be square to the center of the plate from this position, but your upper body will be square to the pitcher. This will also give you the consistency to see the pitches coming in and to see the, the view of the pitcher when he releases the ball to make sure he's not uh, doing anything illegal when he releases the ball. So, so the whole go ahead, go ahead Jason. Okay. So the whole purpose here is to, you know, for your clinics and practices is to make sure that at your clinics that you've got some live pitching, that you can practice your uh, your slot, your where you should be standing, your footwork your height, your, as Jason said, bending the knees. Pitching machine, uh, if you can use a pitching machine, if you can't use live pitching, um, but we need to be able to um, practice these at our clinics. So this is where it kind of all starts. This is where we practice to be, have our, our consistent strike zone. How else can we fix uh, work on consistent strike zone? Again, we talked about practices in winter camps, um, live pitchers and catchers working with a mentor. I work a session in uh, in some of the stuff that I do uh, in the winter. Uh, we actually, we, we will get a, a ball and we will put some dots on it. And then we'll uh, have live pitchers and catchers and I'll, I'll stand probably about uh, 10 feet, 15 feet in front of the uh, umpire and the batter and the catcher. And then I just watch their eyes uh, to see how they track the ball. But we'll put dots on it. So here you can see I've got a blue one, here I've got a red one, and then I've also got a green one. So in the fast pitch side of it, we will take those balls and we'll ask uh, uh, the umpire to not call balls and strikes, but to tell us what color the dots are uh, to see if they are actually tracking the ball. Again, this is how we start to uh, practice and get a consistent strike zone. Uh, Jason, is there anything that you guys work on, say, at a, uh, at a clinic or practice that uh, counts or anything? Yeah, what we do here in uh, in southern Alberta, down in Calgary, we have uh, what's called like a like a uh, like a just a, a a grapefruit league type thing uh, where we all the players want to get out and practice, and we get uh, new umpires or uh, not as experienced umpires to go and umpire the games, and we actually stand there beside them and in the field and work on their pitching arc and they're recognizing on on how to call the game and make their strike zone consistent because everybody knows that it's you know the building blocks to to being a good official is having a great or a, a consistent strike zone so we do that feeling of every year perfect so in your pregame what do you do how do you get ready for your game um, as you get your assignment, do you know your teams? Do you know your players? And I think this goes with not only fast pitch and slow pitch, you know, the game of softball, um, it's in both games. How do you get into the, into the right mindset, mentally prepared? You need to make sure that you're, you've got proper nutrition. There's nothing worse than going to a game and you're either hungry or you're not, uh, haven't had uh, enough hydration in you. So it's important that you have proper nutrition. Uh, and what does this have to do with the strike zone? Well, it keeps your mind in the game and it keeps you focused on what you need to focus on. Um, hydration, same thing. Make sure you're taking some water out with you to the game and making sure that you are hydrated throughout the game. Uh, again, to keep your brain sharp 
and you're, you're, you're self-focused. Train your brain. Train it to um, expect the unexpected. When we are doing a game, we seem to train ourselves to do our league games over an hour and a half. And in a second, I'll have Jason talk a little bit about this as well. But in the fast pitch side of it, league games, an hour and a half, uh, tournament games, an hour and a half, an hour 45. So we train our brain to do that. But then we get into championships. And now we're, we're getting to two hours, two hours and 15 minutes. And I'll talk a little bit later about how this uh, can affect your game. Jason? Yeah, I agree with you, Terry. Like uh, getting to the diamond at least 30 minutes before the game starts, you know, you're not rushing. It allows yourself to focus and, you know, get rid of all the day-to-day the -day distractions that everybody goes through in life and just being prepared, um, having a good meal for lunch, staying hydrated, whether maybe go to the gym after work or, you know, lunchtime, something like that, just to keep yourself uh, ready to go and physically and mentally as well. Absolutely. Mentally prepared by eliminating, like you said, all the distractions, but not only the distractions at your uh, local game, but what about the tournaments you get into or uh, Canadian championship or international events? How do you get yourself prepared for those and mentally uh, prepared to get rid of all the distractions? Maybe it's um, uh, you're in a country that you've never been in before and uh, you know, you're, maybe you're just not eating properly or you're not understanding some of the cultures. So, you know, could that uh, affect you as well? So back to how do I prepare for myself uh, pregame? There's times that I'll take a simple little uh, uh, tennis ball or a lacrosse ball, and I'll actually just bounce it on the wall and follow it with my eyes and catch it in the hand. And that way I'm tracking the ball all the time. Um, I'll do that uh, in the off season, just playing around with the tennis ball. And again, just tracking the ball right from start to finish. Uh, Right from when I, I release it onto the onto the floor, onto the wall, and then into the hand again. So it's again just training the brain. Anything else, Jason? Uh, no, I think we've covered that. Okay. So during the game, so in control, not only of the game but of yourself as well. Uh, if you've got distractions going on in your world, uh, how can you be in control of your game? You need to set the tone. If you go out there and, and you are in control of the game, you've set the tone. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, setting the tone on uh, game, on how, how the game approaches and how it goes along. Um, and remember, it's only one pitch at a time. If you've got something happening, what I try to do is I'll get uh, into my stance, into my um, plate stance, and I'll check my feet and I'll make some marks for myself uh, for the right foot, the left foot, and make sure that I'm kind of consistent from side to side. Uh, balance. I want to make sure that I'm also balanced and I'm not leaning. Uh, make sure my height is correct. Make sure that I'm tracking it, uh, the ball. Um, so how do, we, how do we do all of that? Uh, how do we make sure that we are tracking the ball um, all the time consistently? Those little things that we help with that we talked about here just a few minutes ago, uh, practicing. Um, are we calling it too soon? And if we are doing all this stuff and, and things are going sideways on us, um, we got to get back to the basics. Jason, anything on slow pitch on that? Yeah, I think with uh, you made some really good points there, Terry. And one thing that I do, I've got a, a couple checklists that I go through uh, when I start the game. And first of all, I'd be myself. I'm not going to try and be somebody else and and work on their game. I'm I'm my umpire and I work on how things how I like to do my games. But checking your your feet and your alignment is one thing I do uh, every game, whether it's a league ball first of the year or cane championships or your whatever it is I'm doing. I'm always checking my alignment because that helps me refocus. Next thing I do is I just take a deep breath. Um, just it's a game. It's going to go through it. You'll be fine. Breathe. And that way you're allowed to, you know, after that you can set your standards, uh, but you got to be ready. So in, in slow pitch with the mat, there's no real strike zone. So what you have to, the biggest thing is for the consistency of your strike zone is the height of the pitch. So from pitch one, you got to be ready to go. 
whether it's make sure you call it illegal or or let the let the pitch come in and make it uh, let the batter hit it. So one thing is very important is be ready to go from pitch one. Absolutely, and I think that um, you know as I as I reflect back on my career, I remember a game that I was doing a local game, and I thought I was having a great game. I didn't think that I was having any issues, and this is when I really started to focus on my strike zone and my plate game and say, okay, if, if that ever happens again, what do I need to do? So as I started going through this session, I'm going, yes, that's exactly what happened and, and uh, how I fix things. So at that game, I thought I was having a great game and, and I had batters looking back at me and it's like, I had a bit of an attitude that said, you know what, get back in here because the next one's gonna be a strike. Um, you know, so at the end of the day, you have to make sure that you're you're hearing what the players are saying, you're making sure that you're checking your alignment, that your balance is fine, you're not leaning, that your height is good, and that you're tracking the ball. And how do we track the ball? We track it, you know, in the fast pitch side of the world, we track it right from the hip. Mm, I don't think so. I actually track it right from when the time that the pitcher starts all of his their their movement. So, you know, as soon as that ball goes into the glove and I'm watching it, I'm watching to see if there's anything different that they're doing. I watch it right from the very beginning uh, and then I track it all the way into the glove and just a little movement with the nose uh, into the glove to, to track the ball, making sure that I'm not calling too soon. And if I do, all I do is I step back if I if I feel that my strike zone has gone away, I step back. I'll make that um, uh, couple of changes, and then I'll uh, uh, get back to the basics and check my feet again, check my height again, and make sure that I'm square and I'm not leaning or or that I'm uh, that I'm balanced. Good here, Jason. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Whoops, let's get back on the screen here. There we go. After the game, after the game, are you self-evaluating? Are you taking notes of the game? And this one particular game, after the game was over, I actually had a player come over to me and say, Terry, that's probably the worst game we've ever seen you call. And I'm kind of looking at going, well, it wasn't that bad. I thought it was pretty good, actually. Um, and then my partner, basically, yeah, it wasn't your best game I've ever seen you call. So then I had to step back and go, okay, what happened? Why did this game go sideways on me? Why did I think I had such a great game? And, and why did the players think I had a terrible game? So self-evaluation, I took some notes of the game and it happened to be a playoff game that uh, I was assigned to work with the same two teams and the same partner again. And the partner asked me, you know, the next day of the game's up, he goes, um, Terry, what do you want to do? And I said, what do you think I want to do? I'm doing the plate. Um, after that game, the players came to me and said, that's probably the best game we've seen you call. So it's just stepping back on the in the saddle and, and doing it again and making sure that I did it properly this time. Reflect on the game, how was the tempo? We talk about tempo of the game. And we as umpires, uh, plate umpires, we can control that tempo of the game and we control it by really having a consistent strike zone. Uh, and the players can get in a groove and they're not guessing what we're gonna be calling. But at the end of the day, we have to be honest. What could you work on and what went well? And if we're not honest with ourselves, then we'll have that game where it's like, I wasn't that bad, I was actually pretty good. But the player's no different. and that's who we're out there working for is those players and the fans and, and we got to make sure that we're doing our job. So Jason. Yeah, I think self-evaluation really is very important as in, at any level as an official um, in slow pitch, we basically do all our games one man. So you don't really have any, anybody to talk to um, on how you did your game. I guess you can relate or see how the, the fans or the, sorry, the players, how they, uh, how they react after the game or during the game. But I think, one thing is, is just find out what you did wrong or not wrong, but how can you change it? How can you make yourself better? And in a, in a working in a, in a Canadian championship game or a game when you're working with partners is 
is we always debrief after the game saying, hey, guys, how did it go? What did you guys think? Like Terry had said, his partner said it was kind of the worst game he's seen Terry ever do. But And that's where being honest comes in. If you're just going to blow smoke up the guy's um, ego, it's not going to help anybody. And so really it is uh, reflect on the game, be honest with yourself and be honest with uh, the people that you work that you work with and go from there. And Jason, do you have any um, examples of when uh, you had a, a game that kind of went, uh, you know, your strike zone or something was going sideways and how you brought it back? Yeah, I've actually got, uh, I've got a, a couple. I've got one where it was a Canadian championship, um, you know, third or fourth inning. I was doing the game, working pretty good. I thought was, everything was going well. And uh, I took a pitch off and I let that, the pitch was high. And I came in and I hit the mat and I called it a strike. And as soon as I did that, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was high. That was a brutal call. And in the Canadian Championships, uh, the count starts at uh, one ball, one strike. So there's there's no room for error to take a pitch off. So next thing you know, it's one ball, two strikes, and the batter takes a step out, kind of gives me a look, kind of mumbles, and uh, I can't say anything because I realized I made a mistake. So what I had to do there was, you know, bring my focus back to the very next pitch, like I said earlier. Just take it one pitch at a time. Next pitch exactly comes in. It was pretty much the same height. I'm ready to call it illegal. I called it illegal. And, uh, you know, everybody respected the fact that, okay, I was able to bring it back in and and the game pretty much carried on as, as it had from the beginning. So it actually worked out well, but I realized I made the mistake. They realized it. I brought it back in and uh, the game carried on from there. All right, thanks, Jason. So one of the things that I want to talk about here, and this has been talked at uh, several other um, blue conventions and stuff, monocular vision. What I want to do is I want to talk about the weak eye. Again, we talk about, you know, when I've got a ball here that, that I, uh, I use for guys to track it. So what we do is first we'll, we'll actually identify what is their weak eye and how can they fix that or how can they use that to um, help out their strike zone so if you're a you know if you're if you're dealing with a right-handed batter and you've got a um you know your heads you got a your right eye is your weak eye what i've told people to do is to actually just take your head and just move it a little bit so now you're going to bring your right eye a little bit more in so that you can try to pick that up and work your right eye a little bit better uh, in picking up the picking up the ball. Uh, same thing on the left hand side, just moving your head so that you can actually see the ball a little bit better um, and and pick up the uh, track the ball right from the very beginning. So need to work on tracking with both eyes. Need to be able to pick that ball up right from the the very beginning uh, when the when the pitcher brings the ball together, um, when they start to release the ball out of the, you know, both hands apart, um, when they start to wind up right from the hip and then follow that ball right into the, to the glove um, and basically need to pick up the ball um, into a binocular vision where you're actually uh, using both eyes to uh, pick up the ball instead of uh, using one eye. Hopefully we can figure out how to do that. Um, I know that uh, you know when I work with the tennis ball, it does help. When I work with the balls and identifying uh, the color of it, it also helps. And I think that it's helped out uh, several of the umpires that I've I've worked with. Um, but do remember that it's only one pitch at a time. We can't fix the pitch that we just threw. So how do we make sure that we uh, continue with that strike zone or try to fix it. I had a, uh, an example in uh, Lima. I was working the U.S. team and second time I'd worked him on the plate and the catcher goes, Terry, you're calling low tonight. And I didn't, I really didn't think I was. I knew I had something going on. I knew there was something happening. I just didn't think I was calling that low. So I ended up, uh, um, I didn't fix it. I left it because we're probably in about the third inning and I wasn't about to fix it in the third inning uh, because how many times have you heard, 
come on, Blue, you called it like that in the first inning. So we want to make sure that uh, we're keeping it uh, consistent uh, throughout the, the evening or the, the game. So do remember, it's only one pitch at a time, and uh, we can correct what we, we can't correct it today or the last pitch, but we can actually correct it uh, moving forward. So a couple of um, a couple of little tidbits that, uh, or little quick facts that I just want to throw out there. Um, the plate is 17 inches wide, and the black portion of the plate is uh, one inch on each side. So you know if you start measuring the plate and going, okay, how far off can I go? Uh, you know, can I go one ball off? Am I going to go two balls off? What's my strike zone? Where am I going to call the limit? Am I too wide? Am I too high? Am I too low? Um, work on making it consistent and work on uh, making sure that you are from first pitch to uh, the last pitch of the game, that you are consistent. Like I said earlier, we, we seem to train our brain to only work and we have that five, that, that fifth inning slump where uh, that hour and a half, our strike zone seems to go sideways on us. We need to figure out how to make sure you bring that back, staying hydrated, properly uh, feed the brain and uh, proper nutrition. So I think that uh, that's getting us into about 27 minutes. Jason, did you have anything else? Uh, not really. I just wanted to say uh, another pro tip that you, you might remind me there was um, when you're calling slow pitch with the mat, it's uh, like Terry said, it's two feet across, three feet long. But what you can do is also to help yourself is to pull the mat uh, towards you uh, away from the away from the plate about an inch or so. That way, that gives yourself some some uh, definite some definition between the plate and the mat. That way, there's no discrepancy of all. Oh, if it hit the plate or it hit the mat. And it's a ball or a strike. If you pull it away from the plate about an inch, you'll give yourself the definition, and it'll make it a bigger strike zone, a bigger target for the pitcher to hit. It should make your, it'll help your games go a lot easier. And like Terry had said, uh, hydration, nutrition, and just uh, pregame is is very important. Uh, make sure you're ready to go when the game starts. Thank you, Jason. So in closing. I just want to say thank you and when you compete with a person you only have to be as good or better than the person to win if you compete with yourself there is no limitations to how good you can be and i think we can all be uh, really good plate umpires really good umpires uh, we just have to make sure that we're consistent with what we're calling night after night thanks everybody thank you well, thank you guys. Um, did have a couple of questions coming up here, but that was, uh, I learned a, a couple of things in there and learned a little bit more about slow pitch. Every time I interact with slow pitch people, I enjoy it because um, I will tell you, it's it's one of the things that as national director of umpires, I was always the fast pitch guy. And I, uh, when I when you see slow pitch played at a high level, it is a heck of a game. And it's a heck of a game to umpire, and I almost wish I I had some years left in me where I could go back and and get involved in doing some high level slow pitch because uh, it's it certainly is a challenging game. A few questions here, um, Jason. Um, Softball Canada uh, has gone away pri uh, from a from a, uh, a strike zone and gone to a mat. Um, your thoughts on that and does that make it difficult when you do have to have what are some of the things that you need to do to get ready when you do have to go back into a strike zone situation yeah that's uh, it's a great question actually jeff thanks um so here in alberta league play we play with the strike zone and we go to provincials and Canadian championships we use the mat uh, i'm fine with calling both uh, I, I don't mind the mat because like i said earlier it's just a simple not a simple but it's just the whether the ball is coming in high or low that makes it a little easier because if it hits the mat, it's pretty much black and white. So just be ready to make sure you call those illegal because that's the most important thing of, of uh, you calling mat ball is is no strike zone. It's all with the mat. And so when I go to the United States, or uh, it goes back to strike zone. So it's kind of tough sometimes to uh, 
to go from mat to strike zone back to mat. But if, if you prepare yourself for both, knowing the championship you're going to, you can prepare and uh, it'll help you from there. Terry Bradline has a question. Um, when you were talking about the Lima example, what was the conversation with the USA catcher after the initial comment? Do you tell him he might be right, but it's not going to be changing the rest of the game? No, he actually, he just, he had comment to me that it's, um, he said, Terry, you're calling a little low tonight. And I said, okay. And he said, but don't change it. I said, I'm not going to. <laughs> so it was um he said we're if you're if that's where you're gonna call that's where you're gonna call so so don't change it tonight good and and i knew right away um i would say probably within about the third batter i knew that i was there was something going on and i just didn't know how to correct it at that time uh jason your friend daryl uh, wants to know what helps you be consistent on calling the high or the low pitch um, and uh, so that the uh, the arc at the elite uh, level they push these limits pretty good yeah I've just uh, when I first started uh, I was I used to struggle with uh, with the 12 feet um, so just working throughout the years I just kind of developed uh, a sense of where that 12 feet is and also, too, uh, during even during games to this day, I will watch the pitcher warm up just to get a view, a sense of where he's looking at because he wants to push those limits. So he's going to toss them and warm up those limits as well. And so I just, it's just kind of developed over the years. Some people, you know, pick something in the distance to help them with that. Um, I've never had that work for me. So just the uh, working throughout the years of, of, of getting the experience through the games and uh, practicing that way. I know some people have used the bill of their cap or in some way to, to line up and use it. That is a cue. Yeah, I with me being a, a shorter person, that doesn't really work for me. Um, it just uh, it just works just watching the, the pitch come in and uh, I've just kind of developed it from there. Right. Uh, another question for you, Jason. Uh, lots of slow pitch questions, and they're all fast pitch guys asking them. How loud should you be when calling the legal pitch? Just loud enough for the batter and the catcher, or do you want the whole team to hear? Uh, I like to have it so the infield can hear me. Um, I'm a I'm a bit of a louder guy, so um, and being a bit short in stature too, they may not be able to see me. So I want to make sure that I'm loud enough that they can hear me and uh, call it as soon as it becomes illegal. That way, uh, everybody knows what's going on. The runners, the pitcher, the infielders know it's going to be an illegal pitch. I think one of the things I'd miss as a, if I, as a slow pitch umpire would be the, the strike three. I mean, we get to, on the fast pitch side, you got that big emphatic strike three and, you know, the, all the, the mechanics that go with that. And slow pitch, it's a little more, a little more demure. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think the guy has, but he has to do the walk of shame after uh, the third strike. So <laughs> no sense to be kind of uh, adding to that because everybody knows, like, you just struck out. You should probably just keep walking to the bench. So uh, the slow pitch guys, we don't really uh, uh, light them up too bad after a strike three. Cool. Well, listen, guys, thank you oh so much for this evening. This was great, uh, and uh, we had a good crowd tonight. It was good to see you, and thanks for your time. Um, and uh, we will uh, hopefully uh, get back on the field again fairly soon. Thank so you that very completes much. That completes episode seven of Blue Connections 2020. Thanks to Terry and Jason for sharing their time and expertise. A special thanks go out to level five umpire Darren Jerwar for his work as co-producer of this series. Join us next week as Frank Omo talks about owning the rules and how to learn them. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Oh, those are my dogs now. Yeah, <laughs> those no. are my <laughs> Those are my dogs. Anyway, um, thank you, Terry and Jason. And just a reminder that all of Blue Connections 2020 will be available later on the Softball Canada Empire YouTube channel and our Facebook uh, page. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Good night, everyone. And those were my Thanks, dogs. <laughs>